In this video, I'd like to talk about Swing Transformer version 2 paper from CVPR 2022 that tries to make the original Swing Transformer architecture more efficient. If you don't know how Swing Transformer works, just make sure to view the Swing Transformer video. Otherwise, let's get started. Language models are scaled up incredibly successful. For example, Megatron has 530 billion dense parameters, or Switch Transformer has 1.6 trillion sparse parameters, which is a lot. But you might wonder, why can't we just do the same thing, but for the Vision Transformers? And to answer this question, we gotta see the architecture of the Swing Transformer. So, as we can see here, we have different variants like Swing Tiny, Swing Small, Swing Base, and Swing Large, that the difference is that they are having different channel dimensions and the number of layers within each stage is different. But can't we just add more channels and have a more sophisticated architecture like Swing X Large or Swing Huge, which has more channel dimensions and more layer numbers and probably can capture a better representation of what's going on in an image? Actually, we can, and they even tried that, but they faced a problem. And if you look at the loss curvature over different epochs, you can see that, assuming this is the epoch 4D, you can see that it increases until epoch 4D, but then it becomes unstable. So the others of the Swing Transformer, they wanted to realize what's the issue and they plotted this figure, which the y-axis is average feature variance and the x-axis is block ID. Based on this figure, we can see this pattern that as we go deeper and deeper in neural network architecture, the average feature variance increases until some level that it becomes unstable and we cannot train it anymore. But what is the issue? So to figure that out, we just need to look at how multi-head self-attention works. So we have some x l minus 1, which could be x0, which is normalized, and then it goes to a layer normalization, and it is again normalized. But then it goes to an attention mechanism, and the output of the attention could have any mean and any variance, and that would be added with the normalized x0 and the output would be some unnormalized value. But is it problematic? Let's just see that. So this unnormalized value that we have in the middle, it goes to a layer normalization again, it would be more normalized, so it would be zero mean and unit variance, but then it goes again to an MLP and the output of MLP could again be some unnormalized value. And this unnormalized value would be added by the initial unnormalized value that we had in the middle. So this XL that we have in the output has some variance higher than the original input. And as we go deeper in the neural network, we are expecting that the variance should be bigger and bigger. And that is the issue. So to mitigate this problem, the others proposed a very simple solution that they said we can just simply change the order of layer normalization and the attention and MLP modules. So now when we have X0, which is normalized, it is goes to an attention, the output would be normalized, but then it goes to layer normalization. It would be normalized again. And the normalized X0 would be added by the output of normalized value of layer normalization. So here in the middle, even though the variance would be a bit bigger than what it already was, it is not now as bad as it used to be in the left figure. And this value that we have in the middle, it goes to an MLP and it would output some unnormalized value, but again it goes to a layer normalization that would be normalized again. So by doing this simple modification, which is the first modification of this paper, we can kind of make the training more stable. So yeah, the first modification is what they call res post norm, which means we are applying the normalization after instead of before. And for the second modification, we just need to see what's happening inside the self-attention mechanism. So in the multi-self-attention, we have some 
input Z and some WQ and WK and WV which output our query and key and value and we take the outer product of query and key and then it would be added by this parameterized relative position bias that you should know about it from relative position bias video. But then it goes to a softmax and the output would be multiplied by the value and that's our final output Z prime. But the others realized that after visualizing the outer product of query and value, it kind of pays attention to some pairs of values more than the rest. I mean, that's the point of it, right? We just need to pay attention and focus on certain pairs of the input patches. But they realized that they will, be, they will become more dominant and they will assign much, much higher value than the rest of them. And that's bad because that basically means we are only focusing on some specific information and we disregard the rest while they might be helpful for our final prediction. So they instead proposed this scaled cosine attention, which is the same outer product again, but before applying outer product, we just need to normalize the value of query and key, because that's the definition of cosine, right? Some dot product divided by their L2 norm. But now for the second vector, instead of K, we are having K transposed. And the other thing that they also defined is this tau scale, which is unique for every head that we have in our multi self attention. And yeah, that's the second modification. And for the third one, which I believe is the most interesting modification in this paper, is scaling up the window resolution. So here in the table at the second column, we can see that what they do is that they train the swing transformer, this new architecture having res post norm and a scale cosine attention on a window size 8 and the input resolution is 256 by 256 and then the top one accuracy would be 81.7% and once they do that they want to scale up the architecture so what they do is that they change the window size from 8 to 12 and they also change the input resolution from 256 to 384 and once they do that without any additional training, I mean, they only do that on the inference, they realize that the performance drops from 81.7 to 79.4. But what's the reason of this dropping? I mean, when we change the window resolution, we are having more tokens, right? Because we are using the same patch size and more window size so we have more patches and patches are the tokens so we are having more tokens but why is it problematic because initially when we look at the input z it is n times c dimensional meaning that we have n vectors and each of them are c dimensional and the query and key would also have the same dimension because the wq and wk are c times c dimensional and the outer product of query and key would be n times c multiplied by c times n and also normalized because it is cosine now. So the output here would be n times n. And the output depends on the number of tokens and we increase them. But why is it problematic again? Because now we add it to relative position bias and relative position bias is nothing but a learnable matrix that we added to the output of cosine attention to the query and key, which is this n times n matrix. But we are having more number of tokens now. And initially, for example, let's say it was a value like 100 and by 100, but now it is 120 by 120. It is more than what it used to be but we are having learnable parameters for relative position bias for that 100 by 900. So what can we do for this additional 20 by 20? So the other said, we can kind of interpolate this relative position bias matrix and make it bigger by applying some techniques such as bilinear interpolation. But it appears that this is not very helpful. And, uh, 
we just by doing that it decreases the performance from 81.7 to 79.4 because we didn't learn anything for these new vectors that we have we just interpolated what we already learned and that's not the point of learnable right so what they do is that here they fine-tune it but with a few amount of epochs so let's say initially they train it with 300 epochs and they achieve this 81.7 percent but now that they increase the window size and input resolution they train with the fewer epochs i don't really know how many it is but it is much much fewer than 300 but and after doing that it increases the performance by this fine tuning over the same data set to 82.7 and if we increase the window size to 16 and 20 and 24 and also the input resolution again as we increase without fine tuning the performance becomes worse but after the fine tuning the performance becomes better and better such that with window size 24 and input resolution 768 the performance after fine tuning would be 83.2%. So yeah, that is with parameterized position bias, which is that relative position bias which we know. So here the others say can we find something that is kind of more effective and can produce a better result after this is scaling up. So yeah, they propose a solution for that. And those are these two continuous relative position bias. One of them is in linear space, the other one is in log space. So let's just talk about them right now. So for a continuous relative position bias, they say instead of just having a learnable matrix that we add to the output of query and value, either dot product or cosine attention, whatever, uh, instead of having that matrix, we can kind of learn an MLP, which we can denote here by this G, that the MLP receives two inputs. And the inputs are the relative coordinates, delta X and delta Y. And having these relative coordinates, our neural network G has to predict what is the output value that they should put in the learnable matrix that they want to add to the outer product of query and key. And yeah, that's better right now, right? Because when we increase the window size and input resolution, that means that we have a higher delta X and delta Y. And when we give them to the MLP, the output that we get kind of makes more sense than that simply applying by linear interpolation because now it is kind of learned to predict those outputs. So far good, but then they realize that the extrapolation ratio is too high. And when I say extrapolation ratio, I mean the new delta X and delta Y divided by the old delta X and delta Y before increasing the window size. So to mitigate this problem, they propose log space continuous relative position bias, which is coming from this formula. And it kind of makes sense because when you look at the log plot, we can see that the log is undefined for negative values. So since delta X and delta Y, they can be negative, we take their absolute value, but again, they can be zero and the log of zero is negative infinity. So we say instead, log of one plus absolute value of delta x and delta y and about the sign of x and y that we multiply before logarithm is to preserve the sign of delta x and delta y i personally believe that this should be sine of delta x not x and again sine of delta y not y but i guess they might just a typo error in the paper because when you look at the implementation, you can also realize that it is sine of delta x and delta y, not the sine of x and y. But yeah, they also provided a couple examples, which they say if the window size is 8 by 8, then the range of values is from negative 7 to 7. And when it is enlarged to 16 by 16, then it is from negative 15 to 15. 
Then they say the extrapolation ratio should be 8 divided by 7, which is 1.14 of the original image. But quite frankly, I don't really understand why they say 8 by 7. Uh, if you know, just leave it out in the comments because it doesn't really add up. But anyway, this is what they say. And they say after applying the log space, we can see that the extrapolation ratio decreases from 1.14 to 0 0.33. And that's kind of better as we can see from the result that uh, by applying linear space continuous relative position bias, by increasing the window size from 8 to 12, the accuracy actually increases without fine tuning from 81.7 from to 82. And after fine tuning, it becomes even better. But that's for the only case that without fine tuning, it becomes better. Because in other cases, that when, when the window size becomes larger and larger, then the accuracy before fine tuning is worse. But after fine tuning, it becomes better compared to uh, just applying bilinear interpolation. And even in log space, since the difference of the range is not too high, but because of the logarithm that we apply, then it is even better. And the other thing that they also mentioned in the paper is GPU memory optimization. They did three different things and they just provided a very brief explanation of what they are. And that's what I like to talk about now. So the first GPU memory optimization that they did is what we can call zero redundancy optimizer. You can check uh, the detail from the paper if you like. But overall, the whole purpose is that, let's just say we have three GPUs for training of our model. So what's happening right now without zero redundancy optimizer is that the data, I mean, a batch of data that we have, it is divided into three different parts. And each one third of the data in our batch size, it goes to a separate GPU and is processed. And then the outputs are going to get accumulated on the end. But the issue is that for all of the model parameters, they should be kind of repeated separately for, ev for every GPU, because otherwise we cannot do the forward and do the computation if we do not have all of the parameters, right? But that's kind of not efficient. And in zero redundancy optimizer, somehow they managed to uh, just pass one third of the parameter to the first GPU, one third of the parameters to the second GPU, and the final one third of the parameters to the third GPU. And that can help a lot, especially in the case that we have like 3 billion parameters. Then as they say in the paper, we need something like 48 gigabytes, if I remember correctly, of GPU memory. And we do not have it right now. Even GPU A100 has like 40 gigabytes of a GPU memory, and that's not uh, feasible. But with applying the zero redundancy optimizer, we can make it feasible. And the other thing is activation checkpointing. And they say that the activation volume that we have in the middle, they can take a huge amount of memory from the GPU. And somehow they manage to handle that by decreasing the training speed by 30%. And the final thing is sequential self-attention computation, which is the easiest one. And in this uh, technique, when we have, for example, this architecture of swing transformer and a batch of data, what we do is that instead of passing a batch of data to the architecture, we pass them one by one sequentially. We pass them to, for example, to stage one and stage two. And after the stage two, we'll let all of them to accumulate. And then we pass a batch of data to a stage three and a stage four. So for example, in stage one and stage two, it is sequential. And from stage three forward, it is in parallel. And that could kind of optimize the memory while it decreases the training speed a little bit. And finally, let's just talk about the model configurations that we can have right now. The Swin version two tiny, a small, base and large is same as what we had in Swing Transformer. But now that we have the layer normalization after attention and MLP, we can propose Swing version 2 huge and gigantic, which they have more channel dimension and more blocks within each stage. And yeah, that's it. Finally, we can just take a look and see what is the performance for image classification on ImageNet. And here are the results. 
we can see that uh, comparing Swing version 1 with Swing version 2 in base and large, the performance is a little better because of the cosine attention that we have right now and the layer normalization after that. But we can also scale it and have Swing version 2 large and gigantic. For the gigantic, we have like 3 billion parameters, which is a lot. It takes a huge amount of resource. And uh, imagine that 1K top 1 accuracy, the first version of it, it could be 90.17, which is still not the state of the art that the Google has, that which is QuadNet. But QuadNet is pre-trained on JFD uh, private data set. They have 3 billion images for pre-training. But Swim version 2, they said we do not have that. So we can kind of have ImageNet 22K extension, which has 70 million images, which is a lot, lot fewer than JFD that Google has. But still, the result is competitive. And for ImageNet 1K, the second version of it, which Google doesn't report anything for it, they say, yeah, we can try that and have the best one since Quadness just didn't report anything for it. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, that's for the image classification. They also did a couple experiments for object detection and segmentation that if you're interested, you can just check it in the paper. So if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. And until the next video, goodbye.